Before we get started today, I'd, I'd like to make a few acknowledgements. First, everybody who moved up, thank you very much. It's just <laughs> against human nature and behavior to sit in front of you rows, but when we're filming, it really makes a difference. Uh, so I appreciate it. Secondly, being the day it is, anybody who thinks they're in costume, stand up. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Mirkashi just been at Sonia. Uh, I'm glad you think you're in costume. <laughs> so, uh, we're fortunate today to have our presenter, Dr. Rick Hendrickson, joining us. Uh, Rick is a clinical instructor in the Department of Family Medicine and uh, the director of the primary care track in the medical student programs. And so, without further ado, Rick, take it away. Thanks, Oswin. <coughs> Let me just test the sound. Are you guys hearing me all right? Okay, and we go to Ben in the back? Okay, so um, welcome. It is Halloween. I was going to come dressed up, but I thought better of it. Um, and I guess I am a little dressed up. I usually wear a sweater, so I guess that's a little bit. Um, also, thank you for, for moving up to the front. That'll leave some space for people in the back, the stragglers. Um, and I am uh, very excited to be uh, speaking today to you guys. Are we... Where, Going to get the lights down. There we go. Okay. So, um, so as you can see, the the topic of the discussion today is a little bit different than we usually have. Um, the topic is applying evolutionary medicine in primary care, and secondary to this topic, nothing in medicine makes sense except in the light of evolution. And this, um, this is a topic that is, uh, has become very important to me over the last few years and has uh, changed and structured the way that I see patients and, and how, um, how I deliver my care to my patients gives, gives me a new framework. And I'm very excited to share this with all of you. I think you, some of you have probably heard and people in my clinic definitely know that I talk about nutrition a lot and I talk about exercise and talk about uh, this, this subject quite a bit. So I'm excited to share kind of some of the, uh, the foundation of what I discuss um, with my patients, with all of you, and would hope to um, have a pretty good discussion either today or, or in the next couple weeks about, about this subject. Um, so my objectives today are just to help you first, number one, to understand some of the basic principles of evolutionary medicine. Number two, um, understand the framework for nutrition that's based on evolutionary medicine. Um, number three, um, give a little bit of some understanding between a possible correlation between uh, government-sponsored nutrition guidelines and our overall health. And then four, um, help you guys gain a, a couple different ways to apply evolutionary medicine to primary care. Uh, for disclosures, I haven't received any funding. I am um, on the board of directors of a group called Physicians for Ancestral Health. Um, and all the, ex all the opinions expressed are my, mine alone. I don't represent anything to the department of the university. And then all the mistakes and errors in the presentation are my own. Um, if we find anything, they are not from my contributors. So um, to start off, trying to give a little bit of uh, history of evolutionary medicine, what this means. Basically, this is the application of modern evolutionary theory to the understanding of health and disease. Um, what, th what that means is we have this theory that was first, you know, first come thought of during the time you know, Darwin published origin On the Origin of Species, and then subsequently was refined, changed, through this modern uh, synthesis theory of evolution. And um, this, this theory uh, permeates biology and, and our sciences. And this is really taking that theory and trying how do we apply it to medicine? How can we apply it to how we treat our patients? Um, and and um, really this, uh, this first quote that I put up, nothing in medicine makes sense except in the light of evolution. This is a quote, it's first by, um, uh, by uh, Dobonsky, who said, uh, nothing in biology makes sense ex except in the light of evolution, and kind of turning that a little bit to medicine, and how can we explain medicine and health based on our evolutionary nature. So, um, so first off, um, also, um, Mormon, Mormon evolutionists. So I am LDS, I'm part of this culture. I think there are a lot of people that are very strongly Christian in our area. Whenever we talk about evolution, this topic seems to always come up. Um, the belief of evolution in our, in our country it is somewhat a pol polarizing topic. And for me, it, it doesn't have to be. For me, it fits in very well. Religion and science, I, I think we have 
both limited understanding of religion and limited understanding of science, and in some grand cosmic way, they, they meld together very well. Um, I just don't think that my understanding as a man is, is, is grand enough to understand how that works. And I, I try to look at principles from both and apply those and bring those together. Henry Eyring, um, you guys might have heard of him. He um, uh, is a very famous chemist that was here in the University of Utah. If anybody took chemistry here at the university, took it in the Eyring building. Um, and um, he, he, he really did not see much of a conflict either between science and, and religion. And, and saw that we as man um, have, that, have that issue. Um, the same guy, Theodosius Dobonsky, and nothing in biology makes sense except in light of evolution, and also had this quote, he talked quite a bit about, about his faith. Um, so he says he's a creationist and an evolutionist. Evolution is God's or nature's method of creation. Creation is not an event that happened 4,000 BC, but this process began 10 billion years ago. For him, that, that's how it worked in his mind of how he brought um, this creation and evolution together. I think for the purpose of our discussion today, um, we will talk about some of the modern theories of evolution, knowing that you know, this is a theory, but I think one that we can use to the benefit of our patients and one that we can use for our understanding and, and can be very helpful. So um, for those that are in the room that, are, that, that not, might necessarily believe in, in the theory of evolution, I think there's still some ways that you can, you can gain some help and understanding of, of, of health and disease um, through this theory. So uh, I want to give a little bit more background on, on how, what this theory is and how, and how it really works. I'm going to start from the beginning. I'm sure it's been a while since we've talked about natural selection, probably ninth grade biology class for a lot of you. Um, but the, uh, there's four main principles of natural selection. And these principles, the end result is adaptations, things that change, things that we have adapted for part characteristics in our species or in an animal, for example, that, that have provided some benefit. So number one, we, we look at that there are, within populations, there are phenotypic variations. For example, in, in a bird population, there's, there's yellow feathers and black feathers. So those are two variations phenotypically. The next is that heritable genes are passed on to offspring. We see that the yellow feathered birds then have yellow feathered birds' children. Um, there's competition between organisms. So we'll see that the yellow feathered birds and the, the black feathered birds um, will be competing in that environment. So um, there are limited resources that they're both competing for. And then number four, that there's non-random success that's based on that phenotype. So the fourth one is the key where there is success for the yellow or the black feathered birds depending on that key phenotypic trait that's going to allow the, those birds to propagate um, and produce offspring. So that adaptation, for example, if the yellow feathered birds fared better, that adaptation is very key in this natural selection process. So when we talk about mismatch, mismatch is that that certain adaptation that was well adapted at, at one point is now mismatched to the current environment. For example, if that yellow feathered bird was using those yellow feathers to protect itself against, uh, to protect itself as a defense mechanism, and then the entire forest burned down, and it was a bright colored bird in a burned forest, that would now be a mismatched trait. It's no longer protective for that bird, whereas the black feathered bird would actually have a protective um, adaptation in that environment. So where yellow feathers used to be good, now they're bad. We'll call that mismatch to our environment. So for an example for humans, um, we th can think of our taste of sweet. Um, we'll look at an apple versus you know, sugar cubes. I, back in the day, we'll say for our ancestors, a sweet taste was a very good adaptation. It helped provide a benefit to, 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 that, to whoever had that sweet taste. That sweet taste signified lots of calories, easy calories that you can take in, and a, a good source of nutrition that was very helpful and protective for that, for that individual to then carry on. If he had a sweet taste, he was able to, to enjoy eating honey better, let's say, or an apple, which then he was able to find these high calorie sources much better. Now, in our modern life, this is a mismatch. Sweet taste actually uh, still signifies high calories, but for us it makes us feel good, we like this taste, but now in our modern life, we don't need, that adaptation is actually 
a negative result. We don't, that good trait that used to be uh, protective is now harmful for us because now it drives us to continually eating these sweet foods. We enjoy sweet foods that have more calories, more, more nutri you know, higher density of calories that are really not beneficial for us. So another example, uh, we'll talk about running. So we all wear shoes now, and so some people have thought, well, these shoes are a mismatch. They're, they're, we should start running without shoes, right? So yes, yeah, so e uh, evolutionarily, we didn't have shoes. We walked around barefoot. And we, if we think, OK, so we can talk about, let's remove our shoes, and then things will be, will be improved. Unfortunately, um, yes, we get in injury with shoes, but we also get injuries without shoes. So when we're thinking of a clinician in this area, um, you can't just jump to say, oh, just take your shoes off. Go back to the, the primitive way of life, because there are other mismatches that we have now. We have glass. We have pavement. We're not running on dirt trails. Our feet aren't adapted. Our musculature is no, no longer adapted through our lifespan to running without shoes. So we have to be careful in, in how we discuss this that, yes, it's probably a, mi a mismatch that we run around in shoes, but jumping right back to that original environment might not be the best for our patients without further training. So we have to kind of look at both of those and see how that mismatch is going in our modern world. Um, another uh, mismatch. So um, humans and primates, and other, we developed to evacuate our bowels squatting. We now sit, especially in the Western world, we, we sit on our toilet instead of squatting. Um, I would like to think that this perhaps could provide some mismatch in the way that, um, way that we carry out this process. The angle um, of our anal canal, our sphincters, this change as our geometry changes, um, does this squatting relax our muscles that we lose when we start sitting down? What could potentially this cause? Well, uh, there are diseases of the colon. Maybe diverticulitis is caused by this process. Perhaps this is a, this is a theory that um, or hemorrhoids, other things that if we went back to squatting, using squatting t toilets, perhaps we would, uh, we would be able to, to remove some of these diseases from our, our modern life. So is this a mismatch? Is this something that is, is going on that if we would revert back to a more natural way of doing things, would we remove some of this disease? And that's, and that's another theory that we have um, for, for the squatting versus sitting. So um, I like to think of four key modern mismatches in, in our, from our modern life. The first one is nutrition, which I'll focus on today. Sleep is absolutely one that we now in our modern lives with artificial light, with our busy sleep schedules, with waking up early or being on call, certainly mismatches for residents in sleep. There's no question that, that we're out of our natural uh, our, our natural environment, our natural way of sleeping. Lack of movement, we certainly see this. Our ancestors moved, stood up, squatted, this type of movement all day long, whereas now um, we're either sitting um, or we're laying down or sitting really basically almost all day long. Um, our posture has changed. We don't move as much. We don't exercise as much. This is certainly a mismatch that has come from modern life. Um, the next one I think is a culmination of a few, and that is stress. We certainly have different stressors now in modern life compared to when our ancestors were here. Our stressors now are chronic, maybe low-level lo low stress, not the acute stress that maybe our ancestors had, had to deal with, with um, acute situations that, pr that prove dangerous. Getting attacked by an animal, for example, is it a stressful event. Um, that is a very cute, it goes away. Our stresses now seem to be chronic. You know, getting the bills paid, financial stresses, arguments, you know, in, in, in the workplace or whatnot that provide this different type of stress than we're accustomed to, this, uh, this mismatch of our modern environment. Other ones that are p potentials up here, sunlight. Um, we're, we're used to being in environments where there's much more sunlight um, than we are now. That modern mismatch likely causes our vitamin D levels to be much lower. Um, we're, our skin is not accustomed to the sunlight, so then when we are in the sunlight, we, we get burned. We, we have problems in that environment. So, this, so the, these four key modern mismatches, I think we can look at as a foundation of when we're talking to our patients. 
Um, when someone comes in with a complaint, we can say, you know, does, this, does that complaint fit into one of these modern mismatches, or what is the mismatch, potentially, that we could, we could improve with our patients, and that could, in turn, provide a, a higher level of health. So I want to talk about nutrition specifically. So I, I think that modern disease, diets create mismatch. We, um, we developed an environment where we had natural, whole um, foods that had high nutrition, um, where with very little processing, to now our modern diets are full of processed foods that um, are lower in, in nutritional value than, than we might be used to. So, um, and I'll go into this more in depth. I think the hypothesis that I have is this mismatch in nutrition leads to inflammation and metabolic syndrome. And I think that many of the diseases of modern life come as a result in part from this increased inflammation and, and mismatch through our nutrition. So what are we adapted to eat as humans? This is always the big question. So what are we supposed to eat? Um, and we've been trying to define this for, for the last 50, 100 years or so of what foods are, are optimum for humans to eat. Well, we've lived, one thing that we can look at is our ancestors have lived in a variety of environments. We didn't just grow up in one environment and, and we were done adapta adapting to that environment. We've been in many different places from the north to south, hot, cold, lots of areas where there's different and variety of, of food sources. So, how can we look um, at what we're uh, designed to eat? I think we have two main ways that we can look at this. We can look at fossil records, anthropology um, through the fossil records, and then we can also look at modern hunter-gatherer groups. And we can help to extrapolate or theorize what we're most designed to eat based on those two groups. It's not going to be perfect, but I think that's really the only two ways that we have available to us um, without having the time machine, of course. So. Um, so let's look at food additions to the hominid diet. So about 25 or 23 to 5 million years ago, basically, as hominids became on the earth, uh, the types of foods that we were eating are plants, insects, and larvae. This was, this was the mainstay of our diet um, and a ver very low level of processing and, and mainstay of our diet. Two million years ago, um, roughly from the, the fossil records, is when we started, eating, started adding meat, bone marrow, and organs, so basically animal products to our diet. Um, one to two million years ago, we started adding tubers and bulbs, and then as recently as 40 to 10,000 years ago, added grains, dairies, uh, legumes, and then, you know, as recently as 100 years ago, added Cheerios and Twinkies. So, um, as we look at the, you know, line, well, I don't know, as a, of adaptations, we can see that a very small number of, you know, a very small percentage of time, hominids and uh, we've been eating grains, dairy, and legumes. So starting you know, as early as 10,000 years ago, we added this into our diet. Very, very, very recently, we added Cheerios, Twinkies, processed foods, Hot Pockets, pizza, you name it. Those foods we added very, very recently. The time it takes for us to have adapt adaptations is most likely longer, for sure, than Cheerios and Twinkies. Um, and I think we can... Um, make some arguments that 10,000 years ago was probably not enough for most of these adaptations to become um, benefits for, for us as a species. So um, we, we kind of look at this as a diet, as, a, as our nutrition foundation, is if we, if we based our foundation on the top three groups, then perhaps these foods are what is best designed for us to eat. So then let's look at some traditional people. So yes, question. Yes, so good. So about, uh, we'll say fire was probably about 400,000 years ago. Um, cooking started, so probably back here, certainly within enough time for adaptations to occur. But certainly we have the ability to eat raw foods, but then we probably have adaptations starting about 400,000 years ago is what they think through fossil records of fire. Um, so looking back at, at traditional peoples, people that have lived um, within, you know, within our recorded history, trying to glean some information. There are, there are, there's anecdotal evidence, missionaries' journals, physicians' journals um, that have been to far off places and, and tried to record what diseases they saw present. This is from Albert Schweitzer's observation. He, um, he, uh, he lived in Africa, in Gabon, and for about 40 years. And he says in his journals and his writings that he saw 30 to 40 patients a day 
and it took him 40 years before he first saw the case of appendicitis. Now maybe he just didn't see appendicitis, maybe that, that disease, they never were able to come and see him, but I think it's a reflection of some types of uh, diseases. He was seeing a lot of disease, mind you, infectious disease, trauma, things of that nature, but uh, for example, appendicitis he hadn't seen. He also states that he saw no cases of cancer really when he first was um, in, his, in his mission um, in Africa, and then he saw increasing numbers of these types of modern diseases as, as the people that were living there started eating more modern diets. There's clearly more um, going on here. We, we have a hard time, you know, recording data, for example, and, and making sure, but this is just his anecdotal evidence um, that we're looking at. Question in the back. Yeah, so I, I'm not, I don't know the life expectancy, but certainly when we look at traditional peoples, and this is a major question that comes up, is life expectancy. You know, in, in traditional people or people before modern life, um, life expectancy was certainly less than it is for modern peoples. Um, I, I, I would suggest that this is ma mainly based on sanitation, um, the ability of having, uh, uh, staying away from disease, um, acute illness, for example. Um, but certainly we don't know um, for sure if, if people were older, um, that's not part of this anecdotal evidence, unfortunately. So um, what we can look at is uh, some other modern hunter-gatherer um, groups. And this is, uh, this is out of a book called Food and Western Disease, um, in which about 200 groups were studied. And in, this, in, in these groups, um, about three-fourths of these groups had half of their calories from meat, fish, and, and shellfish. Um, but, uh, but we see a huge range. So the Af there was a couple African groups that were the best studied. And in these groups, there was a large range of percentage of calories from animal sources, from as low as 26% from animal sources to as high as 68% from animal sources. Um, so there's a huge range of our macronutrient, we'll say, percentages of, of where we find our foods. We also see a group called the Katavans in which up to 70% of their foods are carbohydrates in the form of tubers and fruits. Um, then we can look at the Inuit people in which almost, you know, this very high percentage, if not higher than 70% of their diet, is from animal sources. Um, and so we see that there's a huge range of foods, but what we don't see much of is we don't see the modern, you know, the processed foods, those types of foods. We see, we see natural foods, but there's a, a wide range of macronutrients. Um, one of the, uh, one of the, the modern diets, um, one of the mismatches of modern diet, I would say, or the, the theories is a very strict and important look at macronutrient percentages. And I would say that we've had healthy people um, or groups of people, I don't, uh, sorry, not, not necessarily healthy, but groups of people that have lived, that have adapted to eating a, a, a wide variety of different food sources, okay? So I think what we can say is we are adapted to eat um, a large variety of, of different types of foods. Okay, so then we look at grains, sugar, some of these processed foods. I would suggest that these are luxury items. These are items that um, are more recent in our history that were reserved um, in traditional times for, for the nobility, for the rich of the groups. And uh, the reason being is I, I think we can look at grains and sugars as this large amount of calories in a compact volume. These are very highly prized. You could keep and store and take with you um, a large number of calories um, that taste really good and, and store fairly well and were reserved as luxury items. We look at the steps, for example, to like make bread. Um, back in traditional times, we, there were many steps. So from, and I'll just go through these. These are, these are by Joel Salatin. Um, he's, in his book, he kind of describes this process. The first thing we have to do is till the soil with a plow with oxen or horse. If anybody's done that, I've never done that. It sounds miserable. Um, then you sow the seed by hand. You have to weed the field. You have to sit the gra he grain head off, stack the grains, take the stacks to the threshing floor. Then you have to beat the grains to dislodge the grain from the head of the husk. Then um, you, have to you have to throw that grain up in the air. And this is what winnowing is. I had no idea until I was looking into this. Winnowing is the breeze that blows that shaft off of the grain head. The grain falls to the ground, you gather the grain, and then you grind the grain, and then you make bread. So 
multitude of steps that prevented easy access to these foods. So in our modern life, um, we have instituted a few really awesome technologies to improve the production and availability of grains. For example, instead of tilling the soil with a plow, we do it with a machine now. We can go from one acre a day to one person to over 100 acres a day with a machine. Instead of sowing the seed by hand, now we use a machine. Weeding the field, we use chemical weed killers. And then this huge process um, in the middle here is replaced by the combine harvester. And um, the combine, the reason it has its name is because it combines all of these processes into one event. This harvester, the combine, takes all of that work and does it in one event. So then we get our grain, we make it into flour, we use flour to make bread. Step two, or the bottom step, is we just go buy it from the grocery store. So we are far removed from our natural process to make bread. I don't think this necessarily means that we're not adapted to eat bread because it's a hard process, or we're not adapted necessarily to eat grains because of this process. I think this shows an availability um, that in traditional life, our availability of these foods was much less than it is now. So there are, there are a couple of ways that we can look at foods and determine if they're healthy for us to eat. And I, I pulled this from Whole Nine Life, and each of these would, would take at least an hour or two to really get into the specifics of why and, and the science behind these. But I really think that we can look at these four areas. So grains promote an unhealthy psychological response. We have this craving oftentimes for breads that, that, it, that the taste, that function, and that, that brain response really drives us to continue eating these types of foods. An unhealthy hormonal response. When we eat a, 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 a load of grains, it does things to our insulin levels, our cortisol levels, that I think is unnatural in the way that we would generally be able to eat foods because we have such a high concentrated level of the carbohydrates. Um, they promote an unhealthy gut response. This is where we talk about gluten-free diets, people that are celiac or gluten. This process um, has, is causing inflammation, and, and, um, this, and then the fourth one is increasing overall inflammation. So these four things certainly don't have time enough to talk about today, but I think are the key reasons why, why this theory suggests that grains are not ideal for humans. So um, right now we're going to take, oh, perfect timing, exactly 30 minutes. Okay, we're going to take a little break, and we're going to exercise a little bit. We're going to learn how to properly squat. So as you can see, this baby, and if you look at babies, um, they squat in our natural way. Um, if you've ever looked at your nieces or nephews or your kids, they actually do this squat. And so I want everyone to stand up right now. And we're going to learn this process. You might have to get out if you, or turn sideways so you don't hit the chair. So there's several steps to squatting. All right? We're going to get the blood flowing a little bit. So first off, I want everybody just to squat the way they would normally just squat, just so they can feel what it's like, OK? So just squat down as you would normally squat. OK, then stand back up. If you need to use a chair, that's OK. We do that with our patients in the, in the rooms. So OK, so first, number one thing that we want to do is we want to put our feet in the correct placement, OK? So about shoulder width apart, with our toes slightly bowed outward, all right? Second thing we want to do is we want to keep our head, make sure our head stays up slightly above parallel, so we don't want to be looking at our toes. That will create a, a, create a process where you're going to fall over for it, okay? So the next one, most humans, all of us, and our adults, what we'll do when we want to start squatting is we'll bend our knees. We say squat down, and we, we immediately bend our knees. This puts, a, puts us in a, a disadvantage in the, in the geometry of our knees that places them in front of our toes. That puts a lot of strain and stress in our squat. So I would like you to rethink, remove that. When you're squatting down, you're going to start with your butt, OK? I want you to go and you send your butt back and then down, OK? So the, that is a key process of squatting, is I want you to really push your butt back and then squat down, OK? Rather than initiating with your knees, pull down with your butt first. All right, so make sure your knees track over the line of your foot. We don't want your knees to go out or in, OK? So you don't want your knees bending in when you're squatting. We want to keep a lot of pressure on our back, all right? And then we want to keep our lumbar curve so it doesn't, so it doesn't, uh, do, it doesn't settle. We don't want to be bending forward. We want to have a bad curve on our back. And then as we're coming up, we want to squeeze our glutes and our hamstrings, all right? So squatting 
is, a, is an exercise not of our quads, it's an exercise of our glutes and our hamstrings, okay? That posterior chain is critical for our squat. And then the last one, um, sorry, then we just continue that process. That's our squat. So let's practice. So butt back, all right? Keep your toes back, everyone down. Come down in your squat, squeeze your glutes, hamstrings. Come back up, make sure your knees don't go in front of your toes. Let's try that again, all right? Okay, knees behind your toes. Make sure you get your butt back. All right, so that's our little exercise. So that is how we squat, if you're wondering how to squat. So that, because of sitting on a chair, you guys can sit down. Sitting in chairs has, has allowed us to totally forget this very important movement. We have very weak posterior chains, very weak hamstrings, very weak glute, glute muscles that our bodies are not used to when we start to exercise. Oftentimes, those will be muscles that have big problems and will get injuries because we don't have very well-developed posterior chains. And one of those reasons is we sit on those chairs. We use our quads a lot more. We're very quad dominant compared to our hamstrings. OK, so that was our little exercise break. Hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. OK, so um, <clears throat> we're going to look now at some of the history of our dietary guidelines and, and uh, some correlations we can pull out. In, uh, we did not have um, a very good lead organization for nutrition until about until the late 70s when uh, Senator McGovern really pushed for a centralized um, body to lead nutrition percentages. So this became the Department of Agriculture. Um, the, uh, our, our Health and Human Services, those groups uh, did not come up with the, the charge. Um, and it was the Department of Agriculture and this is the same year that Senator McGovern, Senate Committee, um, released the Dietary Goals for Americans. Um, starting in the late 70s, the first time, really, that there was a very specific guideline for what Americans should eat. Before that, there were, there were advertisements that were eat healthy, but this is the first time there was very specific guidelines um, for what we should eat. So this is, um, the, on the left, are some of the macronutrient guidelines. Um, they, were, they were very specific about what percentages we should eat and where, where, what, we should, what we should be doing um, based on, based on the, the theory at the time of optimum health. So they recommended a 45 to 60 percent of our calories were from carbohydrates. Um, our pre-guideline intake of carbohydrates based on some data by the CDC, which is very difficult to get nutrition percentages in widespread population studies, um, very difficult to get this information, but from what they looked at, our pre-guideline intake was about 44 percent. After, after the recommendations, our, our current intake, at least in 2004, was about 50 percent. Um, goal was met. Our calories from fat, 25 to 35 percent. Back before the guidelines, we were just above this. Now we're solidly in the range. We've met that guideline. This is overall American diets. Um, 10 per, they wanted 10 percent of our calories or less from saturated fat. We started about 12.9, we're about 11, so we didn't, we're not quite do our goal, but we didn't make improvements here. 300, less than 300 milligrams of cholesterol, we started at 270 and we about stayed at about 270, so we've met that goal. Less than 25% of our calories from added sugars. Um, we, we have decreased our added sugars percentage, we've met that goal. Um, we've added other things besides sugars. Um, then, the, then a sodium um, recommendation that which we haven't met. So the process of, of, of stating an exact percentage whoops, um, in these guidelines, um, rather than a very, a, very, um, a very whole foods based guideline, this really changed the culture, I think, of food, of how we view food. And we started viewing food as macronutrient percentages, rather than looking at whole foods. We started thinking, this piece of bread has this many carbohydrates, and this can of food has this percentage in it. What, we're, what, what I think happened at this point is we had foods that were then marketed as low fat, heart healthy, like Cheerios, you know, healthy for your heart, because they fill um, certain percentages. That changed the culture, I think, of allowing, and then by technology, we started having really amazing you know, food scientists that were designing foods that met these percentages. So as a result of recommendations, I think a few things happened. 
Number one, this replaced saturated fat. I think instead we move to partially hydrogenated vegetable oils and these trans fats. These designed fats that our bodies were not used to eating were replaced by these foods um, and, and we, we removed some of the fats that our bodies were designed to eat. As a, as a result, we increased our vegetable oil uh, consumption. Reduced total fat. Well, if you take fat out of food, as we all know, it doesn't taste very good. So what do we do instead of having fat in our foods? Sugar, sugar right? So then we have, we've added high fructose corn syrup or other sugars as this process of our desire to reduce total fat we've added in another product in our designed foods. We wanted to lower cholesterol. Instead, we added, you know, we've increased our soy lecithin, um, which is, uh, is, is not a, as natural necessarily as the foods that contain some cholesterol in them. So I think that there were secondary effects or, or effects from these dietary guidelines that were not anticipated. And some of these were our designed foods that were still based on recommendations but I think are probably less healthy than, than, than our traditional foods. So let's look at specifically what we changed. And this is from that same data it's from CDC in 2004. So before the guidelines um, to after the guidelines, what did we do? We increased our total number of calories by 250 calories. All right. And as you can see in this red line, the majority of those calories were carbohydrates. We did decrease our saturated fat just a little bit. Slight bump in protein, slight bump in fat, but by, by far, these increased number of calories are from carbohydrates. In large part, from, from some sugars, but then also just total carbohydrates by eating foods that, um, that are designed and have, and, and we're relying more on carbohydrates than we were in the past. So, this is a correlation, this is not a causation. There could be lots of reasons for this, um, but, I think, but I think it's, I think it's an intriguing look of the effect of, of these government-sponsored guidelines had, potentially had, we don't know, it's a correlation, but if we look at the first dietary guidelines, 1977, we see a certain level of population with overweight or obese BMIs. And traditionally, we only have data in the 1960s. We don't have anything before that. That was, um, we just didn't keep track in America. So in the 1980s, we have this data, and then we start seeing this huge spike in overweight and obesity that correlates to dietary guidelines. Now, I don't know if this is a causation. All right, there could be lots of reasons. There's probably lots of reasons. Modern life, um, but I think it's something that we can't dismiss. That potentially there was an effect um, on on our health because of these dietary guidelines. Are we, are, we, are we giving guidelines that are, that are most appropriate for, for, for us to consume? So what we can look at is the guidelines that we have are certainly not working. All right? As you can see, as a population, we are meeting most of those guidelines, yet still our health and our obesity problem is getting worse. What, what, what's going on? And I think this has to do with mismatch and food quality. I think that there is a, we have a mismatch with these modern foods that are easy to find, easy to consume, taste really good, have been designed so that we eat more, and, and that this mismatch has caused this problem. That, that's my theory. Um, I think that food quality matters. I think eating more natural foods, vegetables, fruits, meats, nuts, seeds, uh, would provide a more health benefit rather than eating designed foods that are more processed. So. The, um, this, uh, this specific diet, um, which I would say is not really new diet, there's a lot of different names for it. This was a, this was a paper that was published in 1975 called the Stone Age Diet. And, and um, really looking back to our roots of how we ate uh, before modern life. So <clears throat> this diet has now become popular um, recently in the last 10 years. And it's mainly, it's called, it goes by several different names, either primal, caveman diet, paleo diet is one other way that it goes by, and has gained traction as people start seeing um, and start changing the way that they're eating. It's become more popular in both um, lay press and, and, um, and in our patients. So when I talk about my diet, I eat this way, I, um, I talk about um, a lot of the positive ways and 
things that I do eat. And I, and I try to te uh, teach it in a very positive manner. This is also something that I pulled from Whole Nine Life. So I eat real food that is fresh and natural, foods like meat, vegetables, and fruit. Foods that are nutrient dense with lots of naturally occurring vitamins and minerals, rather than foods that have more calories but less nutrition. I'm not lacking in carbohydrates. I just get them for vegetables and fruits rather than bread, cereals, or pasta. So um, a very positive way, this is kind of the, back, the backbone of, of how I've chosen to eat. And a lot of my patients that come to me um, are similarly choosing this, this system. Another way that we can look at this system um, is looking at processed foods and food quality. So <clears throat> I think that there is no way that we're going to remove all modern foods from our diet. I think it would be inappropriate to try to, try to have somebody be 100% only on you know, natural foods. But I think we can kind of look at it in a couple different ways. This green column are foods that we have a green light to eat. We can eat as many as we want. These are foods that familiar ingredients. Packaging, there's none. There's no label. Doesn't make any health claims. Like this is broccoli or apples, all right? So when you process these foods, you have to cut the apple or you chew the apple, okay? So you cut, clean, shell, you peel. You find these at farmer's market. These middle foods are more traditionally processed foods, foods that we can process at home, for example. There's very few uh, ingredients, but there's a few. Minimal packaging, simple labeling, don't make health claims. So things that we can do at home is how we process. So for example, we could make butter, we could make sauerkraut, we bottle or can our food. These are foods that we can eat, but we probably need to limit the amount of, that we eat. Probably not safe to say we can eat as much as we want, but these processed foods like roasted almonds or almond butter, for example. Then this last group I would say are industrial processed foods, the foods that we should probably limit as much as we can from our diets for optimum health. These are foods that have some very sophisticated packaging. You know, these foods like Cheerios that make these health claims um, that are in colorful packaging, highly processed, highly digestible, highly um, uh, able to, to get those calories in your body very quickly because of these processing methods. Um, they taste great. They cause, they, they cause these um, abnormal psychologic response, like these sodas, sugars, pastas, cakes. So these are the foods that we limit as much as possible. You know, a treat every once in a while, you know, every once in a while you, you might go through a red light. I don't think we ever want to do that, but, but we don't want to do that, okay? So, but it's, you're not going to die if you do, but it's probably not the best for your health. So, so we can use those techniques or ideas as a foundation of how we can speak with our patients. So I would suggest that we can start using these with our patients. And I would, number one, would encourage us to not recommend, quote, diet and exercise and leave it as that. I think that we, it's not an afterthought. I think we should build the foundation of our practices on healthy nutrition and healthy movement. And, and building that foundation is as number one way that we can improve the health of our patients. I would say that we should probably try to avoid the maladaptive pattern that a lot of our patients take when they're dieting, quote, dieting. And that is really restricting their calories while at the same time increasing their activity level. I think this produces a lot of stress on the body's system. I think this is a maladaptive pattern where somebody will diet and they'll exercise and then they'll burn out. Then they'll go revert back to the way that they used to eat. Then they'll diet and exercise. They'll burn out. And they keep going back and forth, this yo-yo effect. I think this is a maladaptive pattern. Instead, encourage this whole nutrition way of life instead of re cutting calories severely and increasing exercise severely. And staying positive with our patients. I think this is another way we can do it. Anyway, okay. So I want to tell you about a patient that I had as a resident that I wish I could have helped more. So she came in. Her BMI was about 40. She... Um, She's very active in her job. She worked in the vivarium, which is where they keep the animals for research studies. She was extremely active in her job. She was always moving all day long, burning lots of calories. She'd been trying to lose weight for years. And I was her doctor for a couple years. And I tried everything. We tried increasing her diet. I'm sorry. We tried increasing her activity level. We, I tried to get her to run. Um, she was at work. And I said, you know, take the bus and then walk to work. Um, we tried restricting her calories. We tried keeping food journals. And never could, I could never understand what was going on because she had, for her activity level, a, a pretty low caloric intake. I didn't understand 
why this would lead to her not losing weight. I didn't understand what was going on. I think she was in this maladaptive pattern in which she was really stressed. Her body was extremely taxed and she was having this high level of stress that through the process of her hormones was not allowing her body to say, you know what, let's try to lose some pounds. I think it was a state of panic continually. I wish I could have told her, you know what, let's try to get you to more natural foods. Let's try to, let's try to de-stress and let's try to get you back to a more natural way to help lose some of that weight. I really wish I could have been able to do that with her. So we do have some anecdotal success stories and I have a lot of patients in my practice and I think some of you have probably started seeing patients that are quote paleo, okay? So um, for in, the, in the few months that I've been here, um, I've had patients out of eight either come to me eating paleo or have started eating this way, uh, this diet and I've had some good anecdotal success stories. Now granted these are anecdotal um, but I just want to tell you about one gentleman. 69-year-old uh, gentleman with diabetes. He also has a couple other comorbidities, but I want to focus on diabetes. He came to me first being paleo for about four months and has now been for about 11 months. He was on three uh, oral diabetic medications. He was on pioglitazone, gliburide, and metformin um, when he came to me. He had pretty well-controlled diabetes on three, these three medications. Um, he had been eating um, a paleo diet for about four months, like I said. When I saw him, we decided to, dis to discontinue the pioglitazone and the gliburide. And we wanted to see what the effect would be on his A1C and his health. So um, this ancestral weight loss registry is a, is a registry with other patients and other people that post their anecdotal stories. Um, and they're trying to gather these similar types of anecdotal stories if you're interested in other, in other possibilities of, of some stories. Okay, so this gentleman, <clears throat> like I said, he started well, very well controlled with his diabetes in May. Um, when I first stopped um, his, his two uh, medications, in July we rechecked his A1C and it was 6.2, all, also very well controlled. In October, just recently, still eating this same way, still not um, on his two medications, once again A1C well controlled. So for me, this is the, this is the really good success that we're able to find with this patient. Is, a, a large drop in his weight after stopping his two insulinogenic medications, okay? So for, for four months, he didn't lose much weight on those two medications. As we know, those two medications increase the production of insulin. As we know, insulin um, is a, is a um, hormone that um, acts to increase um, the production of fat in our bodies. It also, by bringing in glucose into our cells, that process um, of, of, uh, that we see. After stopping those two medications, continuing on the diet, he was able to see about a 30, or sorry, about a 20 pound weight loss in the next few months um, in sustained diet. Now, I'm not sure what's gonna happen. Maybe it's winter time, maybe he increased his exercise, I'm not really sure, and this is anecdotal, but I would hope that we can see him continue um, down to the level that he, that, that he is um, and have, have continued success. Um, so I wanted to show you guys his cholesterol. He's never been on a statin. Um, this gentleman that just has not had problems with statin even with his diabetes. Um, we did see a, a slight increase in, in his LDL and his total cholesterol. Um, and this is something maybe we need to talk about. I think that the, the weight loss for this patient is probably more protective of his heart than, than, a, than a bump in his LDL, um, but that's something that we would certainly have to look at for him. Um, but, but we do see a impro slight improvement, probably not statistical, of his triglycerides. So that's what we saw with his LDL. So um, anecdotal evidence is great, obviously, but we need some studies. So there are studies. Nutrition studies are hard to do, okay? As we know, they cost a lot of money, but there are some small-scale studies that have been done. For example, um, this study here, um, we looked at paleo diet in type 2 diabetes, um, and this was done in Sweden by a guy named Stefan Lindeberg. Um, Linda Frasetto, she's a researcher at UCSF, um, did a very similar study looking at um, weight loss markers um, of disease like a cholesterol and A1C and this hunter-gatherer type diet. And so there are research studies happening um, that are on in this area as well. So these are, these are ongoing and, and more are published um, each year as we talk about these things. So what can you do as a provider of healthcare? Number one, I think it's important to think about mismatch with our patients. 
stepping outside now the nutrition for a little while, I think we can look at mismatch in a variety of diseases. What are they doing that potentially is causing this issue? And we can try to use that as a foundation or a framework of the way we look at disease. Number two, I think it's really important that we study nutrition and exercise that's based on ancestral health principles. You will have patients that are coming to you on these diets. You need to know what they're eating, how you can best help them, how you can be the best provider for them. Um, I was attending the residence a month ago, and a patient came in, saw one of the residents on this weird paleo diet, and the resident um, did not, had never heard about it. I was able to teach this resident a little bit about what was going on and how best to help that patient. Even if you don't think there's much credence in this diet, I think it's really important that you understand so you can best help your patients when, they're, when they are eating this way of, um, and, and following a, a nutrition lifestyle like an ancestral health or a paleo diet. And number three, I think you can give this a shot. I think you can try to eliminate processed foods from your diet and we see the effect, we see what happens and you can give it a shot to see what it's like for you. Um, other things that we can do, um, the application of mismatch, I just talked about this. Um, look at how these four areas of mismatch apply to your patients see if we can improve those, use these as, as a foundation of preventive medicine. So fr um, the, frankly, there are limitations to this thought. This is a theory. There, we don't know for sure if this is what we should be doing, but I think it can provide a framework. I think there's a, a new possibility, things that we can learn by looking at this as a framework. I'm not saying this is right. I'm not saying this has the whole answer, but I think that there's a way that we can look at this to see, huh, Maybe there is something with that, and we can continue thinking and learning about that process. Just a second. I'm almost done, um, and then I'll get to your questions. So if you're looking for more information, um, if, uh, Physicians and Ancestor Health, if you're interested, I think on your handout, there's a, there's, a, there's a handout on that. If you're interested in joining, let me know. Um, the Evolution and Medicine Review um, is, is online. You can review that. They publish regularly. There's several different textbooks, Food and Western Disease. This is by Stefan Lindeberg. There's a book called Principles of Evolutionary Medicine that was published in 2009. Um, for the lay public, this is a really good book to start with. It's called It Starts With Food. It just came out this year. Um, evolutionary medicine is becoming more widespread and more popular in academic circles as well. UCLA recently just started their evolutionary medicine uh, project and their program. They have um, undergraduate, graduate courses that are going on. Um, this is the Evolutionary Medicine Review. Um, there are health and, and societies that are popping up in, for this area if you're interested in more information. And I just want to, uh, you guys know a few of my key contributors. Emily Deans is a psychiatrist. Uh, she works in Boston um, and has been instrumental in helping me learn about how mental health is related to mismatch and evolution. Victoria Prince is a, an MD, PhD student. She finished her PhD in uh, liver metabolism and is now doing her clinical rotations. Adele Height is a registered dietitian that is doing her PhD at um, University of Northern Car uh, Carolina, North Carolina, and she is um, helping with a lot of the dietary recommendation um, information and history. Dan Lieberman is a professor at Harvard in the Department of Human Evolution and Biology. Um, he's basically the barefoot running guy. Um, and then Dallas and Melissa Hartwig, our local group here with Whole Nine Life that do a lot of interesting and really good things with nutrition. Um, so here are my references and then questions. Well, I just had a comment about <clears throat> considering evolutionary medicine when we're taking care of folks whose ancestors come from different parts of the world. A big topic that I deal with a lot, I take care of a lot of Hispanic patients who have lactose intolerance and they come to this country where we promote dairy right. from the USDA. And actually, a lot of folks from different parts of the world, e evolutionarily, being able to digest dairy, especially lactose, is actually a mutation that most of the world does not have. And there are large swaths of the planet where people cannot digest milk. Absolutely. I mean, this is so, if I would have had another section of time, I would have talked all about dairy. But you're absolutely right. It's a northern European basic, basic adaptation that was in our population, a lot of people here in Utah. But as we start seeing patients from other parts of the world that simply do not have that adapta ad adaptation, our guidelines are certainly going to be inappropriate for that group. And we need to be aware and, and, we, and see that absolutely that is the case. Absolutely. Question up here. Any calculations in difference of cost between a, 
paleo diet and the standard diet, I deal with the population when I recommend fruits and veggies as they say, I can't afford that. Yeah, so that's certainly that's certainly something I think we do have to look at costs, look at practical look at practical ways that we can reduce cost. I think um, when we when we look at costs, there's a very global large scale of why are the cheap foods cheap, government regulations, subsidies, corn subsidies, we look at all those things, but at the same time, our patients are real and they're living, and how do we help them now? I think one way is as we cut out the junk foods from people's diets, the chips, the sodas, we do find extra dollars to spend on the healthier foods, but when somebody is, is, is eating you know, at the bottom, really it's gonna be hard. And I absolutely recognize that it's going to be hard for a lot of people, but we can certainly try to improve their diets as much as possible within their financial means. And I think that we find in, in some patients and people I talk to that as you do cut out a lot of the treats, snacks, cookies, you do find extra money for those fruits and vegetables. But it's really hard, and that is one of, one of the things that is, is, is hard to motivate patients with, absolutely. What's that? Rice and beans. Is rice, and that's what rice, beans, and chicken. I mean, the entire world eats rice, beans, and chicken because it's cheap and it's produced very easily. And unfortunately, I don't think that's probably the, the healthiest diet for us. And how do we how do we remove like what's available versus the theoretic theoretical and like bring those together? It's really difficult. And and that and I don't have all the answers for that. Absolutely, yeah. Awesome. So it's a very good question. I do see patients when I make this as a foundation of treating their disease that want to make changes and people do, some don't. When they don't want to make changes, I'm still a traditional Western physician and I treat them and I try to help them as much as I can. It's the same way that I treat any other patient, but certainly I think we have an impact on patients' motivation. We can, over time, help encourage them to make changes with their diets. And I say we have been, um, through many years, discouraged by our patients' outcomes with diet and exercise. I think for a lot of years, we've tried to get our patients, and so at, at points, we become discouraged as providers, and we do go to that quick medication first rather than relying on nutrition because we just haven't seen results in a lot of patients. And I would say we have seen some, but we do get discouraged, and I would say we just have to keep an optimis optimistic outlook, and, and we really do have to be that, that drive that, yes, nutrition matters. And even if you're not willing to make that change today, maybe you're willing to make that change tomorrow or in a year when I keep bringing it up. And I do have patients that come to me that are not on paleo, that are now on paleo and are, and are very happy and have lost a lot of weight. It does happen, but I think we just have to be optimistic about it. And just in regards to your cooking, absolutely, you know, in the period after we started cooking, after we started eating animal products and, and, and increased our fat uh, intake, we absolutely had um, that evolution to have greater brain size. Very true. Let's just take two more questions because I'm running out of time. Absolutely. I think you have to include the calorie part in there as well, because percentages, sure, we're all getting 30% of carbs. That doesn't tell me if a person's eating 2,000 calories a day more than they ought to. Absolutely. You're absolutely correct. And I think 
you know, when we look at what happened to our calories after the guidelines, is our calories increased greatly through the carbohydrate consumption, and that's absolutely going to have an impact on this, on, on what's going on. I think what happened is that we now have these foods where it's easy to eat more calories. These designed foods, which um, we can call, you know, foods without breaks. When we look at eel fudge cookies or Oreos, we don't count them in number of cookies, right? We count them in rows of cookies because like that's how we eat them. When we eat the cookies or breads, we can just continue to eat. We just don't have good breaks to stop ourselves eating those calories. When you eat an apple, how many apples can you eat? Maybe one, two? You kind of have to stop at some point, right? But when you're eating processed foods, these designed foods, you eat more calories than, than you really had desire to. You don't want to eat, keep eating red vines, but you just keep eating them because there's no, there's no appetite suppression going on in your body. It's, these foods are not designed in a way that says you're full. Where apples or a ribeye steak or whatever it is say, I am full. Stop eating me. How many sweet potatoes can you eat? You've got to stop at some point. And I think that's a large part of how we start getting these, more of these calories. We're eating these foods that our body just not, we just not know how to say stop. Okay, one more question. Can you make a reference to couple of Jericho uh, running? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we have to see our patients as they are now, and we have to look at their overall well-being, and, and we have to think about, do we have to remove certain foods, or do we have to change what's happening? And, and you really do have to take an individual look outlook. When a patient comes in, I have to see them as an individual and treat them as an individual in their diet and their response and their exercise, because what's going to be appropriate for one person is not for another because of what's gone on the, the previous 40, 30 or 40 years. Absolutely great point. You have to individualize what happens as well. Okay, thank you so much. If you want to chat, I'll still be here for a while. <laughs>